How are you now? James Whelan here, Investment Manager at VFS. With the end of second quarter, beginning of the third quarter, second half of the year, have a look through. First half of the year, have a look backwards. Uh, I am coming to you, well, not live. It's uh, it's the end of a very, very long day for us here. I've managed to put together a bit of a presentation for people. I'm going to try and keep it quick because I know that this will be viewed at 7 o'clock. So I'm just going ahead just so that it doesn't, I don't make any mistakes or anything like that. And if there is a problem, then I can just go over it again. But... Uh, mainly speaking that it's it's just so that I'm going to make it quick because I know that Origin 3 is on. There's a lot of football fans that are out there. I've got my traditional cup of tea and I'll be getting my way through that as I get my way through this. I'm shooting for about 20 minutes, a really good quick one. Some of the things that have happened that are interesting with a view to having a look at what's going to come ahead maybe for the second half of the year, but some of the things that you should be looking out for. As usual with investment management and advice and anything that happens, there's no magical crystal ball. There is the best idea of what's what's coming ahead. That's... That's, that's sort of where I'm trying to align people with the idea, with the overarching thing that you need to sort of stay invested for the most part. The idea is where and what. So that's sort of where that is. Now, uh, I'm going to get myself off here and just go to that. Right. Uh, yes. Well, here's the presentation, which I've learned. Now, it's quick. I'm going to go through it. I've put some slides up and put some things in. I'm going to talk to them if I can, and we'll see how we go. First off, always got to get through the sip of the tea and always got to get through the disclaimer. The disclaimer should be shown for as long as a tea sip uh, lasts for. Here is the, uh, the 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 slide, the main slide, which is sort of my pictograph thing from what happened last quarter. Um, that was sort of this is done at the beginning of the year, um, and I, when I was looking at sort of what was going on there, weather bottom right was absolutely still a thing. Uh, Elon Musk taking over Twitter. Um, what a clown! Uh, I'm still not a big fan of his. We're talking about that there was potential for huge job cuts, the potential, the, the outlook was really grim for uh, for what was happening, looking at um, staying in the defensives, everything that was going on. Um, earnings recession was potentially going to be up. This quarter coming, yes, weather is still absolutely a thing. The market breadth is narrow. The market is being dragged up by only a couple of stocks. And when I say that, when I say the market, most of the time I mean the S&P 500, the, uh, the US market. The artificial intelligence uh, has been the, the biggest thing, but we've seen that sort of start to retract. And also we had that huge banking failure um, or potential failure that, that really did cause a huge shift and almost sort of postponed everything that we had coming up uh, ahead. Moving on. Now, sticking local, starting local. The chart that has not changed much, apart from the fact that, that little line on the far right has seemed to decline more and more as we go through. That uh, continues to bother me in a big way and should also bother you as well. Hang on, I'm just going to check something that you need to absolutely make sure of. Yeah, okay, it's all fine. Uh, yeah, uh, the consumer confidence is, is really starting to slip away and slide away. Oh, sorry, not starting to, continue to. Sorry, I've been all over the place, end of the day. Um, that, that we can see that, that the, the, the consumer is not confident anymore. I, I, I don't know how to stress this is more anymore than, than I did in the last time. It continues to slip. Uh, now, I had the little notes that I had next to it. So this is the ANZ Roy Morgan consumer confidence. It fell despite the RVA leaving the cash rate unchanged. Small gains in current and future financial conditions and in future economic conditions were offset by a decline in time to buy major household item measure. Um, so, yeah, that will keep on slipping away. What I think happens there is that we've got, and sorry, matching this with card activity. This was out of Westpac. I put this in my note on Monday. Um, that card activity continues to slip away. That is extraordinary. It's, 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 it's not unexpected. I mean, sorry, I'm going to stop saying extraordinary. These aren't shocking numbers. This is people are not spending as much as they were. Card spending is going down. It is trending lower. Um, the, the the gray line on the top left chart there, you can see that spending is, is is slipping away. This is a consumer which is actually retracting and really trying to to um, to, to, to keep things tight. They have understood what's ahead of them, and they know the potential is there that the RBA is going to continue to hike at least once, maybe twice. I don't know. Who, who knows what sort of comes ahead of us on this one? Who knows what's going on? Uh, uh, the, the, the housing market hasn't properly been decimated the way that everyone said, so that's sort of that's a kick in the pants. We've still got jobs, and we've still got high prices, we've still got all of these things. We've still got people that are still spending, a little bit less, but, 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 but still, the spending numbers are slipping away. So what does that mean? Uh, it means that, okay, potentially the RBA isn't going to continue to go as hard as they want. I, I disagree. I think they've still got a little bit more in them. 
but it does mean that the consumer discretionary is absolute cactus. Now, these are charts from yesterday. Harvey Norman, Nick Scarley. The thing is that it hasn't actually been represented as much as it should be represented on the charts. These are these are over a year. It goes back to, you know, you can see, I don't know, these are, what are these weekly charts that I put up here? Uh, uh, from 560 down to 350, okay, so they've halved. Nick Scarley, yes, it's sort of come down, not even halved really from, from its highs. They were crazy highs in October 21. Look at where they are. Look at where they are now. Definitely on the ascendancy. Both of them broken out of short term, uh, short term downtrends and, and maybe breaking up to the upside. We've seen a boost in Australia. Uh, I think that there's sort of these big warning signs in the consumer discretionary space that, and I'm going to put my face back on here. So let's just see if I can handle this uh, correctly. There you go. That there's a time that comes in the consumer discretionary side of things when you just say. We are just going to cut everything. And I've talked about this a few times in my note to clients and, and a few bits and pieces where you go through these sort of levels of going, where do we order our pizza? Where do, where, do, where is our pizza level going? You go, we go out for pizza on Friday nights as a family. And then you go, you know what? We're going to get mum or dad to go and pick up a pizza. And we'll eat in. We won't go out. Or we'll go to somewhere cheaper. And then the downgrade is, is we'll, oh, sorry, it's, it's, it's you say we'll get it delivered. And then we'll say, no, we'll go pick it up. And then you say, no, you know what? We'll, we'll order it and... Uh, from we'll get it from Woolworths and we'll have it here. The nice pizza, it's going to be okay. It's not, um, you know, things aren't that bad. And then you say, you know, what, we're just going to make our own pizza. And then you do something with it, which is much worse after that, which is no pizza at all. But that's the example that I like to use of, of households just ticking down bits and pieces that they do. The problem is that the house, the households that we really need to actually constrict their spending aren't the ones that are being attacked, attacked by RBA rate hikes. That's where things sort of get a little bit disjointed on these ones. Those guys are. Their savings rates are going up and the market sort of seems to be ticking over okay, so they're okay. But the people who have mortgages that still have lots of debt that are have already constricted their, their, their spending, they're the ones that they can't do any more than what they're doing, uh, aside from the next one, which is that people have actually got to start losing their jobs and actual constriction in the, in the economy. Um, they're trying as hard as they can. Now, I've got the chart up here, so I'm just going to throw it over onto... The screen let's see if I uh, this is just me classic me sort of trying to do no get off that while I hit that hang on a sec uh yeah, yeah 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 there it is sorry so what I want to do is the Australian economic commerce uh, downgrading consumer spending I'm gonna put that over here all right let's see if that worked hey what do you know it did I'm gonna get my face off so you can see what's going on almost there okay so this here, wow, that's interesting, is UBS research on downgrading the Australian uh, consumer discretionary sector. Um, talking about the same thing as I'm talking about, the Australian consumer is now slowing. Um, uh, COVID uplift, don't worry about that, bits and pieces. So look, they've gone into where they see earnings reduced, ratings downgraded, AX1, Domino's, uh, Premier, Super, and, and some other bits and pieces that are there. Now, Coverage rating summary. So they've got, they've put Woolies up to a buy. So this is sort of where it's interesting that you want to stay away from those discretionary stuff and you want to stick to the staples. That's really sort of an easy way of playing this one. And again, comes into my theme that you have to stay. I'm going to try and zoom that in as big as you can get. You have to stay invested for the most part because you need to stay invested in the market. The matter, the, the question is where. Go to cash is not always a solution and is, and, and, and is only, should only be done in very rare circumstances. So yes, this is a, a, the quick grab from, from UBS, amazing research. They have downgraded consumer discretionary. However, you can see here that the coverage has, has got some staples, huh, staples here, TWA for sure, if you ask me, uh, and West Farmers, bits and pieces like that. So the staples, yes, you, you want to stick at it and everything else. I don't have time to really go through the note. Also, the fact is that it's not really, you know, it's, it's, UBS research, so it's not really something for me to be able to broadcast loudly and proudly on that one. But you can see that there is, uh, I'm very hesitant now, I've gone into consumer discretion too much. Where's the RBA going? Staying local. Uh, the RBA holds, I need a better setup for this sort of thing. Okay. Uh, the RBA is, uh, the realisation that the RBA still has more work to do has reignited fears that a recession may be needed in order to bring down inflation. I believe this is off the, U, the UBS note, um, and which I agree with. Uh, with. And I was just saying, we've got to kill an economy to try and bring rates down. It's same. But equity prices, earnings estimates and valuations still to yet adjust to what could be in store for over the coming months. 
Hmm. We conclude the sectors of the market are exposed to the domestic consumer will remain on the back foot over coming months. Now, my mate Gareth Ed, CBA Australian economist, uh, chief economist, sorry, chief of the Australian economy, whatever you want to call it. Anyway, Gareth, g'day if you're watching. Uh, we forecast GDP growth to be 0.7% uh, year on year uh, for quarter for the fourth quarter 23 and 1.9% uh, year on year for the fourth quarter 24. So anyway, where they go down to, we put the odds of a recession at 2023 at 50%. So then our half chance of there being a recession this year, I am more than that, I think 75% chance of us seeing a recession this year with what's got to ha- what's what's got to happen uh, now there was unemployment rate that they expect to grind higher over 2023 to the end of the year 4.4 percent and be 4.7 percent by mid 2024 um here we go now here's the good thing about basis points that i know everyone wants to know with the, where the rates are going to go gareth has had a pretty good track record being able to pick these things so i'm going to stick with him on this our economic although here's the thing the, the guy from UBS has managed to go 12 out of 12. So if he says up or down, then you probably want to pay attention to where he is, or unless you think that maybe he's running his course. Our economic forecasts are conditional on one final 25 basis point increase in the cash rate in the third quarter, 23, for a peak this cycle of 4 spot 35%. They are also conditional on 125 basis points of policy easing in 2024. You heard that right. 1.25% of policy easing in 2024 so and monet- monetary policy is now deeply restri- restrictive we know that as well moving on so um you're looking at getting uh 1.25 percent off your home loan or, you know, depending on what your variable rate is or anything like that i'm not talking about that but that's what you're looking at so that's what is, is ahead for the aussie economy i think there's going to be a recession but there's some relief next year as we get um mortgage stress sort of declines which means over this time, you want to be playing it defensive. You want to get through it, so make sure that your portfolio is geared to being on the back foot. So you still want to make sure that you've got some of the stuff that you need to have. You need to have BHP. You need to have um, – uh, uh, it's, it's, it's completely gone, but the the, the, the the stocks you need to have. You need to have the banks and bits and pieces like that. However, you just want to sort of make sure – because there will be no massive housing correction. There will still be people paying their mortgages. It's just people will always take the money out of somewhere else. That's the other good thing about the Australian economy and the, sorry, the Australian consumer, the Australian mortgage holder, I would say, is that you can put rates up to a fairly high level and they'll always find a way to pay it. Arrears will go up but not massively go up because you sort of you're tied to your house. That's the idea of this recourse situation that we have in Australia versus the US. You'll take that money out of somewhere else though. That's that's all there is to it. Right, get to carry on because I know that we're in a rush. Now, hmm. We've got reporting coming up in the States. What are we going to expect? What are we going to see? And where do we sort of go through um, into the the back half of the year? Now, we're over in America. We're going over into the States now. The big chat that's going to come out of the States and is coming out of the States is that if those yields keep on rocketing, what's going to do to the market? Everyone's going to freak out. Now, this is this is good. So Kit, he's been on the podcast before. He's very, very smart. And he replied to Paulo Macro. I'm not going to go into who that is. But a fairly decent view on the bottom right of the screen here. So Paula said, deflationist, deflationist, quote, rates going to zero because the financial system will implode bros who want to get paid on their uh, SFI, don't worry about that, in their, uh, on, their, on their short sort of short calls, short rate calls in some 2008 GFC 2.0 hero trade are wrong. It's funny the way that financial people talk, I do apologize for that, um, is wrong. Any move that way will be a head fake to get people on the wrong side of the boat if it does happen, and Kit has responded here, yes, totally agree with Paulo. So if if Kit agrees, it's probably right, because Kit's actually very smart. And even with an earnings recession, we'll probably stop at 8 to 10% drawdown of the S&P 500. So that's that. if you can decipher that, there are people that are like, the only way that rates are going to go back down is going to be market, market, complete market collapse. I will reiterate that... And, and, and the market will correct pretty heavily if that's what they're saying. I will reiterate that the market is, is extraordinarily durable, that the companies within it are also extraordinarily durable, that the, that the companies that are actually pulling the weight of the market are, are, are extraordinarily durable and cash rich. So they, they've got huge cash reserves to be able to keep on doing what they're doing. What also I'm reminded of is that Jay Powell said uh, fairly bluntly towards the end of last year, that it is easier for me to fix something that we break doing this than it is to continue a low rate environment. 
they can continue raising it up. And as things start to break, as we saw with the banking system, they'll find ways to fix it without going back to that same ring around the rosy nonsense that they have low rates continue to prop everything up. I hope that explains it. That anyone who's who thinks that, okay, rates can then, then shoot back down. That being said, bonds are really high. And that's why I've got that bottom left chart there. This is speculative positioning in US Treasuries. That's to the short side. That's as short as it's been. That's pretty significant. If there is an eventual, and it will come eventually, if that inflation number does really start to tick down over in the States, what you're going to see is um, yields, is the Fed eventually saying, okay, we're about done. It's going to start getting towards 2%, and the Fed will say, we're about done. And that will happen. Yields will come right down. Bonds will rally because they, they do move inversely. And... And that will be a huge rocket. The fact that bonds are a net speculative short position does mean potentially as the closeout happens, I mean, the bond market is pretty absorbent of these sorts of things, but you're going to see a pretty big springboard in the bond market. It's a great time to hold bonds on a floating rate instrument, like in a floating rate ETF that I put people into. So I still say keep on accumulating bonds um, as you go, general, general advice, obviously. Keep on accumulating bonds as these rates can tend to trickle up. Because when rates do go down, they will come down and they'll come down uh, to, to a point that's further down to the south of where they are right now. Buy with confidence. And if they don't, continue to pick up that simple yield. That's, it's just that, it's really is that easy. It's okay to have that good, simple bond hold and locking in a really good percentage on your portfolio um, because it's, you know, it's, it's literally risk, the risk-free rate. Mm. Let's move on. I'm almost done with my tea, so I do apologize for that. I need it to keep on going. So... We shuffle on and we shuffle on. So there we are on that one. Were we on that one? Yes, we were. This one's a good one. This is a bit difficult to, to describe. This is a nice chart from the Bank of America. So the one on the left showing that we are about to pass the peak of the disinflationary base effect. So housing is solid, employment strong, Wages are still rising at 4%, 4.4% year on year. The easy part is pretty much over for disinflation. So getting from 9% up here, up here to 4% down here, it was fairly easy. It's just the natural course of things that everything did go high and, was, and, and then they did start to come back down. Going from 4% down to 2% will probably be much more difficult to achieve. So this is the base effect situation that they're talking about here. And this is why people are just like, that's okay, we can head on the way to 2% pretty fairly easily. It took us that easy to get to 4%. What you need is that you need month-on-month -month CPI to stay below 0.2%. Otherwise, inflation will head higher year-on-year. -year. So we've got a base effect. This is the reason why year-on-year -year is so different is because last year was so high. And so we could sort of see that things are coming down. But eventually that really high base is starting to, to, to drift away. And so unless it's below 0.2%, then it won't go down below. You need it down below here. So this is what happens if it stays at that, um, if CPI stays flat, then it goes to, and this is the base effect, it will still stay at 2.5%. So you need CPI to, to come backwards month on month, basically to go down below that 2% target, inflation target. That's a difficult one to describe. I put it in there and I challenged myself and I think I did okay. So no. So that being said, 40% of, of the CPI in the States is shelter. So apartments, rent, owners, equivalent rent, all this stuff that goes on over there. It's your house. The house and rents and equivalents and things like that. They have absolutely started to roll over. That's what gives me relief that inflation is coming down. So stay the course. It will keep on coming down. Garfield Reynolds, friend of the show, uh, friend of the podcast as well, a uh, friend of mine, um, he's... Uh, at Bloomberg, uh, talks rates at Bloomberg, quote, even if optimism that Wednesday's CPI report, that's tonight, so yes, will show a demonstrable slowdown in US inflation proves well-founded. There are plenty of reasons to be sceptical that it would spur a rapid end to the Federal Reserve rate hikes. For one thing, persistently robust data on labour market strength will encourage policymakers to err on the side of being too hawkish in order to bring inflation down to their target. Why stop now with the jobless rate is sitting close to the lowest since the 1960s. I, I agree with him on this one. The Fed, even when it really starts to tick down, the Fed will go, you know what, the foot is on the throat. We finish the job. That's as simple as it comes. So we're going to get these things. Yes, inflation is coming down. Will that stop the Fed? No, don't do it until the Fed say it or they do it. That's when you're going to know. However, keep accumulating bonds. 
we move on? Uh, it's really difficult to read. Yeah, okay. Uh, now we're talking about earnings. The I'm going to be quick through the earnings stuff because you know earnings changes, chops and changes. However, we are in, uh, going to see more of the earnings recession come ahead. Now, uh, 46 S&P 500 companies have issued positive earnings per share guidance for the second quarter of 2023, which is the highest number since the third quarter of 2021, when we had 56. As of today, uh, 113 S&P 500 companies have issued EPS guidance for the second quarter. This number is above the five year average of 96 and above the 10 year of 98. Uh, so that was the positive 67 negative guidance. Look, these numbers are, these numbers are these numbers. I'm just gonna skip over that. Look, it's uh, it's a positive and negative. Look, it's it's a fairly high positive number um, per tier, as high as it was, that's what I said, as high as since it was back here in third quarter 21. Um, but the negative numbers have started to go up because of the negative surprise. So, however, as usual with earnings, there's no surprises when you already know what's ahead. There's no, there's no, they have issued guidance. You sort of know what's coming. Um, usually you're going to get the surprises to the upside. However, it's possible that those surprises need to be something amazing to keep on moving. Looking at Wall Street strategy, uh, Wall Street strategists are sticking to a cautious equity view. Now, this is amazing because at the beginning of last year, sorry, the beginning of this year, those analysts were really, really bearish. I was one of them. I was one of them too, saying you had to play some defense and was going to be volatile. I did not expect that it was going to be as rocket ship to the moon up as it, as it absolutely was. That was something that really got me going. Uh, yes. Uh, now, here is some, some more chat. I don't want to talk about used cars or anything like that. These guys, Carson, I, I, I really like what they do. And he's got this here. Here we go again. I'm going to put this over here. And you can see, and then I'm going to zoom in. That's a really sick. Ryan Dietrich from Carson Group. It's always good because he's always got some amazing stats um, and they they talk about some pretty cool things. Look, th this is something that I really wish that I had a better link for this, but he's talking about when everyone is super super bearish like this, that's when it's best time to springboard and that's a, that's when it's the best time to go up. Um, they are still sticking to their cautious views. Here we go. The other years they expected lower prices during the final six months of the year were 1999, 2019, 2020, and 2021. All the S&P 500 did those years was gain 7%, 9.8%, 21.2%, and 10.9% respectively. The more bearish they are, the better it is for markets. I don't need to show you the details on that, but I just understand that that's sort of a situation that it is going into this one. Beware that, no, I've, I talked about the big stocks that we had in the market doing all of the heavy lifting. Have they run out of gas? Have they run out of gas? That remains to be seen. However, uh, NASDAQ has gotten a lot of attention for being the best performer this year. Participation is thinning out as a percentage of members now making 52-week highs make lower highs. So that's, again, I throw charts up that are difficult to, to explain. 2% of, of the NASDAQ are making 52-week highs. So... It was amazing back in, remember this back in COVID times, all like what 14% of companies were making new year highs. Now that the number of companies that are making new year highs is less. So that's, you think that the heavy lifting done by those big companies was something you need the other companies to step up and, and, and take the NASDAQ on. Those big ones can't keep doing all of the work. It's physically, statistically impossible. Um, so just beware, beware, beware. Uh, S&P 500. Um, just a quick check on valuations. I always like to do this one. And I'm not going to get a chance to talk about Morgan Stanley. I'm just strapped for time, unfortunately. The forward 12-month price-to-earnings ratio for the S&P 500 is 18.9. So this is forward PS. This is what we're expecting for the year ahead. It's 18.9. It's above the five-year average of 18.6 and above the 10-year average of 17.4. So... It's above the averages. So if you think, if, if you're all about reversion to mean, whatever you want to talk about in that particular regard, it is now in up territory, as in the next direction that it would go would be more likely. To, I'm not going to finish that sentence because people will kill me for this one. However, um, it was below it when, I, when last I spoke. Now it's above it. So just play that as you will. I can't talk about um, Morgan Stanley. However, he is talking about that we need to have, uh, they've been bearish on the market for, for some while. It's just going to be interesting to see what, uh, as they take it. Why doesn't this change here? What have we got? Yeah, this is what I'm looking at. Okay, so, yep. The weight of the top 10 stocks in the S&P 500. Now, this is where you're not... 
The top 10 stocks in the S&P 500 are at a record weight, 31.7% of the market cap is held by the top 10 stocks. However, the earnings contribution of the top 10 is only 21.5%. Something's got to give, right? That's just a chart for interested people. Moving on, thank you JP Morgan for that brilliant chart. Now, China, I talked about China last time. So much of what we do in the world does depends on China. Second largest economy, I don't need to go into why China is important. If you do, maybe give me a call and we'll talk offline about it. Uh, China has not had the COVID reopening that everyone expected them to have. It has been disappointing. That's a shame. Goldman Sachs cut its growth forecast for the Chinese economy, um, but in the latest sign of pessimism over the country's muted post-COVID rebound. I have notes. Uh, after a strong start in the first quarter, so China's post-reopening recovery appears to have fizzled out in Q2. Good number. Analysts wrote property, to, uh, property market weakness and falling experts. Authorities delivered a small cut to interest rates last week, and this is the beginning of the month, last month. Uh, uh, authorities, do, 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 but more support is widely anticipated. Few economists believe it will deviate from the current cautious policy-making trajectory. You can see from these charts, things are actually starting to turn down. However, there is a thing that's coming up. I'm going to put my face back on. There is a, a part that's coming up in China. We saw it start yesterday where there are more stimulus and more sort of policy uh, awareness or, or what's the word I'm looking for? Attention, influence is coming in to try and prop up bits and pieces like their property market. So um, some policy changes came in last year um, with regards to stimulating the property market or trying to save it, bail it out, maybe not bail it out, but they're definitely trying to get it back in the right direction. More changes were made to that yesterday and more stimulus sort of put towards that. Now, not to go into the details because it's too quick to be able to do so. However, that's, that's turning things around for China. And that was, that was real news that came out. So if we can see that start to go into the second half of the year, we're going to see China turn around. However, I think that there's a way of going through, oh yeah, Chinese inflation, they're almost in deflationary territory. This isn't disinflation, this is deflation. So that there is a fairly significant chart, pay attention to that, um, that, that China is actually potentially in a deflation. I mean, we're all trying to fight inflation or trying to get the disinflation back in the back in the boards. They're actually probably in a deflationary environment. That's really, that's, that's significant um, for them. However, there's a way to get yourself out of things. That's India, I cannot be more bullish on India. I don't want to go into it. It's a whole other presentation on its own. Everyone knows that I am. China's decline is India's ascendancy. There is business flow and money is flowing in that direction. The money flow from the markets is going into stocks that are listed in there. There's a growing middle class as more people get jobs and get banked into the system. They've got their systematic investment plans that continue to plow money into their own markets. It's sort of like the superannuation function. They plow money into their own markets and their own markets buy their own stocks, and it's just a self-fulfilling prophecy that just runs itself upwards. It's an amazing system. If you're an investor in the market and you want things to more likely go up, um, so that's that's how that works. China, it's it's phenomenal. I can't I can't stress enough just how incredible that is. Oh, now some housekeeping. Beware, 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 because your SMSF. If you're an SMSF holder, I'm not I'm not even on here. Hello. Your SMSF statistically is underweight international equities. That's phenomenal. So 2% of total assets in SMSFs are, I've got this over here, and this is in the Insight Advisor, who did great work. I'm going to see if I can zoom in on this. Um, they lack diversification. Now, you need to be diverse just as part of the rules of having an SMSF, but, uh, but it's amazing just how underweight international equities um, SMSFs are. Just from a simple Diverse, just a simple geographic diversification perspective. You can't be 100% in Australia unless, obviously, there's a huge caveats on that, but it does mean that you're missing out on, on the European luxury boom. It does mean that you're missing out on India. It does mean that you're missing out on... It does mean that you're missing out on some of the best, the best and biggest cash-rich cash tech companies in the world if you're not internationally. There's Apple and Microsoft and Google. These aren't big, scary things that are anymore. These are literally things that you hold in your hand that you can invest in very easily. I was amazed by that. That's the housekeeping that I want to do for the day, um, just on how uh, the how under diversified geographically portfolios are. Talk to me about changing that. Final funny, which is going to be here. I'm going to make time, which is great. Um, instant hire. My son recently learned that he can buy stuff uh, with money, and he came into the office to find this. As kids, we all did it. 
There's the money printing. The kid, <laughs> the kid's going to get a job at the Federal Reserve the way that he's looking. Good for him, um, kid. Always a chart that I like to play. Look at this. It doesn't matter what happens. Here's every single issue that ever happened in the entire world ever since the beginning of time. 1919 goes back here. What happened there? Uh, markets usually go up, usually go up. And if uh, you're a long enough holder, then you can see your way through it. Be careful going all the way to cash. Um, it will do you, it'll do you wrong. But just make sure you have a really good core holding in things you need to do. Um, this S&P returns since 1950. One year later, it's usually up 9% for the max return. The average return uh, sits in this sort of area. 40% here, 7.3%. Um, 10 years later, it's just sort of, that's the, the, the average return as it sort of goes, it goes through. Uh, I think that, yeah, that's a good way of saying it. Yeah, so 9% average return, 7.8% over five years is the average return. Um, you know, that's going to be per annum. So, yeah, stay invested. That's what I could say. Now, where do I think what's going to happen? Maintain a long quality perspective to stay invested. Stay away from a lot of things. As rates go up, you're going to see some zombies come out. They're not the companies that you want to own. That means that they've got too much debt uh, to be able to pay it back and they're not making any money and they can't grow. They're not companies that you want to own. Quality avoids that. Low levered good return on equity um, and good consistency of earnings. Quality, 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 here and abroad. Um, beware of that over exuberance in the seven. Yes, you need to have a holding in those big companies, but the heavy lifting is done. Make sure that what else you own is also part of it. That's why owning a nice, simple quality ETF probably get, get around a lot of those problems. Overweight bonds, look at those numbers, look at those yields. Um, have a good allocation into the portfolio. As the rates come down, bonds rally as well. Long India, I've already said that. Now, I didn't even get a chance to talk. I didn't want to talk about AI because everyone's talked about AI. Long data centers too. The artificial revolution. Now, you know what? Send me a note about that if you want to talk about data centers, if you want to talk about the artificial intelligence revolution and what's coming off the back of that. Um, and beware of the recession. There is a recession. Oh, sorry. There is most likely a recession coming in Australia. We may already be in one. In that case, you want to be on the defensive. You want to be in staples. You also want to be in utilities and you want to be in insurers. Well, um, although insurers are a bit hesitant on. So insurers are something that I've seen put into a lot of research. But we can go to that later. But utilities um, is a good way to sort of uh, play the defensive game in that regard. And don't underestimate artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence usage now. That uh, is the idea that, yes, it's more than just being those big companies or NVIDIA. Now is the time when artificial intelligence will actually start to save regular companies money. And it, it's, it's absolutely being put to use. Now is the time when it will start to save money for regular. So margins will start to increase overhead start to go down, earnings start to look really good. That, that's potentially the next springboard. Maybe we'll see that at the beginning of next year. We might see it towards the end of this year as well, which would be pretty cool. Uh, that's a standard portfolio. Look, I'm not going to go into any more of the details. If you want to know more about us or who we are or what we do or where we are or what we do, then please send us a note. Apart from that, that has been the presentation. Um, uh, yeah, okay, about half an hour. That's all right. I'm going to let you get onto the origin now. It should be starting anytime soon if you're watching this live. Live. Um, and, uh, and get into that. If you want to know any more, send me a note. I'm available through the website or anywhere you want to be, and I'll be able to help you out. But that has been the quarter that was, and this will be the quarter that, that will be. I hope that I've helped you out with that one. I do apologize. I'm a little bit jumpy, a bit skitty at the end of the day on these, on these bits and pieces. But look, I hope that that sort of sparked a little bit of a conversation, some thoughts for you about what's ahead and what's not, um, and I'll see you later. Until then, stay safe, mark well, all the best, and, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll talk to you soon. Bye.